as well as providing a live transcription. So welcome everyone to our In This Moment panel session titled Black Women's, Facili uh, Black Women's Health facilitated by Amanda Chestnut and our lead presenters, Dr. Celia McIntosh and Deborah McDale Hernandez. Today's session is part of Geneseo's month long celebration honoring Black History Month. As part of our efforts of becoming an anti-racist college, these series of events and sessions planned and organized by the anti-racism and DEI subcommittee of the President's Commission on Diversity and Community will hopefully spark discussions, reflections, and actions as we work towards this vision of anti-racism. Before we begin, we ask our participants that you mute your mics during the presentation. We do, however, encourage you to use the chat feature to provide questions for the presenters. We have a lot of time at the end for Q&A, and we ask that all questions and comments are grounded in respect. No disrespect towards the presenter, moderator, or any other participants will be tolerated. We reserve the right to remove participants if these expectations are violated. Now I'll introduce our speakers. Deborah McDale Hernandez is the Senior Director of Public and Community Affairs for Planned Parenthood of Central and Western New York. And Dr. Celia McIntosh is President of the Rochester Regional Coalition Against Human Trafficking. In this presentation, they will provide an overview of how systemic racism impacts the health and health care outcomes of Black women. And they will also discuss the historical longstanding deeply rooted inequities related to social determinants of health, structural inequality, and system failures that continue to perpetuate the cycle of inadequate care, along with discussing barriers to treatment and political implications that may improve or harm health outcomes. I will now turn it over to Amanda Chestnut, an alumni and faculty member here at Geneseo and curator of this In This Moment series, so thank you, Amanda, and welcome Dr. McIntosh and Deborah McDell Hernandez. Thank you so much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm really excited to be wrapping up our February sessions with uh, Dr. McIntosh and Deborah here. I think that this is out of all of the presentations that we've done so far, one that will help provide critical information for the broader community in Geneseo that's really necessary for understanding why so many people are so ardent when they say Black Lives Matter. Um, Deborah and Dr. McIntosh were easy picks for me to include as leaders in the In This Moment project. Uh, both of their books are forthcoming. They're two of the 10 folks who are represented as leaderships in the Rochester area for their innovative and persistent work in um, women's health care and in public advocacy. Um, I understand that you both have presentations. Would you, would either of you like to start? I will start. Great. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead okay. whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for having us here today. I just a little bit more about myself. I am also a nurse practitioner, a family nurse practitioner, actually. I've been a family nurse practitioner for about nine years, been in the health, been in the healthcare sector for about 20 uh, and recently in the last two years or so, I went back for my psych mental health and a doctorate to help improve health outcomes for patients um, in the hospital. So just a little bit about me. So today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the state of women's health. Just to give you a general overview, we know that women of color in the United States um, are one, there's at least one out of five Americans are women of color. They comprise of 20% of the United States population and just about 13% of the US population overall. 
being a black female, we know amplifies inequities. And oftentimes it's been called a double whammy being black and female. Being a black woman in America has often been said to be a balancing act. And one of the things that I found in the literature was that actually uh, we make up the majority of healthcare workers, which is kind of ironic being that black women and um, black and brown women of color are often treated with, uh, their treatment is often rooted in a lot of structural discrimination. And that's often, that's based on 400 plus years of you know, natural oppression. So even though we make up a large population of the healthcare workers, often getting the worst care and often dismissed, not heard, um, which impacts our overall health. Some other factors include that uh, black, women, black people overall, have you, as you've seen this year, has been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. A lot of complications and deaths deaths have been two to three times greater than any other racial or ethnic group. Black women have a higher rate of hypertension, breast cancer uh, of younger ages, diabetes, stroke, lupus. We know that black women life expectancy is about 78, the age of 78 compared to white women of age 81. In addition to that, we also know that black women are three times more likely to have fibroids, which are little um, tumors that are non-cancerous, uh, that grow essentially in the uterus and cause postpartum hemorrhaging, uh, more, more so than white women. And one of the biggest factors, school, school aged black girls are up in low income communities miss two to three days of school each month because they don't have menstrual products. So when we think about how that impacts their life lifespan, per se, if you have, you know, if you're missing school, you have lack of education, right? Then you, you don't get the education that you need. And if you're not able to get the education that you need, then your opportunities, you know, throughout your life is going to be lessened. So that's one of the impacts from that, not having your basic needs met, those menstrual pads lead to lack of education, lead to you know, lack of school days, ultimately leading to some impacts further down in life. So I just wanted to use this little graph here because the reality of it is a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about basically doesn't just start, it, it really starts in birth. We know that there's been a lot of, when we talk about black women's health, we talk about premature delivery of infants, we talk about maternal mortality, uh, and that really starts, so this lifespan here just really tells you that this is from the cradle to the grave. And these are essentially many of the systems that uh, Black women encounter or Black children encounter, uh, starting with the healthcare system upon birth, issues with housing, social, so, social service systems, um, maybe some foster care systems, criminal justice system. We've seen a lot of information about police brutality and just how these systems also impact overall care and health. The education system, like I mentioned, if you're not getting the appropriate education you need, ultimately that has further impacts down the line. Um, and of course, employment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on and how you know impacts on the wage gap um, and not having enough money can um, cause some issues with access to care um, and even insurance. And then again, <laughs> Um, meeting, encountering the healthcare system once again before the great. We will take it from there. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm Deborah McDell Hernandez, and I am the senior director of Public Affairs and Community Affairs at Planned Parenthood, been there for almost three years. And prior to that, I was at the Memorial Art Gallery in various roles, many um, involving community engagement and building. So I've always had an interest in advocacy work and the um, healthcare industry is fairly new to me, but I'm equally passionate about healthcare as I was education and arts. So give me a second. I am going to share my screen. Um, hold on.
Okay. So um, Celia did a good job in laying the groundwork down about how our um, presentation will um, explore these healthcare disparities. But um, since the basis for this is um, looking at how structural racism has impacted um, healthcare outcomes for Black women, I thought we should start with a basic or um, an identical understanding of what structural racism is. So we are all um, speaking the same language. So this is um, a great definition that I found from a study titled Structural Racism and Health Inequities in the USA, Evidence and Interventions. And it is um, structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice. These patterns and practices in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distributions of resources. Now, Celia um, hit on many of these dynamics when she talked about that life cycle um, graphic that she shared. And when you think of all of these, it pretty much covers every aspect of life. Nothing is left out of this equation from housing, earnings, healthcare, media benefits. So this really shows how structural racism permeates every aspect institution of living in the US. So um, this in turn will further, you know, build the case for how um, these negative healthcare outcomes um, start with to begin with. So we're gonna go back in time a little bit and talk about some historical cases because we know this didn't all happen overnight. Um, there's a long history of racial inequity in healthcare. If you're familiar with Harriet Washington and you read the book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present, you may have come across this term. I had never heard of it until I read her book, um, Black Eotrophobia, which I can barely say. But basically, it is the fear of medicine present in the Black community as a result of a long history of involuntary and unethical um, non-therapeutic treatment by medical professionals. And the best example that we see at play right now is the way um, some communities are welcoming or rejecting the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you see this, especially in communities of color. Um, Black people are hesitant about getting the vaccine because of a long history of um, maltreatment, mistrust. Sadly, Black communities and communities of color are also the communities that have been hardest hit with cases of COVID-19 as well as fatalities. So um, sadly, um, this terrible, several terrible chapters of history in the US um, are contributing to many people's decisions about whether or not to get the vaccine. On top of that, um, inequities with accessibility, you have people who are interested in getting the vaccine. However, um, they're encountering many obstacles in accessing it. Um, some of those obstacles might include lack of access to um, high-speed internet. Um, maybe you don't have a tablet or a laptop or a cell phone. Maybe you don't have transportation to go to a drive-through um, vaccination um, pop-up site in the community. So um, you have all of these factors at work, regardless of whether or not you want to get the vaccine. Um, even if you want to get it, you might have some obstacles or challenges in actually accessing it. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of um, inequities um, that have happened historically in um, the medical world. Many of you are probably familiar with Dr. Sims. Um, he is um, lauded as um, a great surgeon of the 19th century and he did a lot of work in developing techniques and tools related to women's reproductive health. 
Um, he also um, was the president of many medical boards. Um, he developed a technique for um, dealing with or repairing the um, fistula. He created the speculum that is used um, in OBGYN offices. However, the dark side of this is he used enslaved black women for his research. Um, consent wasn't even a thing then, but it, even if it was, um, consent would not have been requested or required of a black um, slave. Um, no anesthesia was ever used. And as a result, black female slaves suffered indescribable pain and sometimes even death as a result of Dr. Sims' medical experiments and research. Now, Dr. Sims was not the only person guilty of this. This was common practice those days. Um, many doctors were guilty of using slaves as their um, experimental bodies, so to speak, in developing um, different procedures, even um, the C-section, um, creating um, methods or techniques for doing the C-section. Many um, black slave women's bodies were used for that. So um, again, this is, um, it's very, it's a painful part of history when you think of all of this that was done. And even after Dr. Sims perfected the procedure for um, fistula, when they used it on white women, anesthesias were used for the procedure, but um, black women were not offered the same courtesy. You're probably familiar with the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. That's the official name of the study. If you go on the CDC website, um, that's how it's referred to. And this experiment involved 600 black men, 399 actually had syphilis and 201 did not have syphilis. It was supposed to last just six months. It lasted 40 years. Um, you might ask, why am I using this as an example since the study involved males? Well, it involved males, but it impacted females because many of these males had intimate relationships with females. Um, there again, here we go again with no informed consent. So they were asked to participate in the study. They received as compensation, free meals, medical exams and burial insurance. So those who actually had syphilis were never treated for syphilis. Um, this even after doctors realized that penicillin could be used to treat syphilis, but um, it was never offered to these these unfortunate men. And um, in the end, now these are the numbers that I found, the data, um, but I would, I would guess that these numbers are actually higher. But what I found was 28 perished from syphilis, 100 passed away related to complications from syphilis, 40 spouses were diagnosed with syphilis, and the disease was passed on to 19 children at birth. Now, we all know that sex happens outside of the structure of marriage. So this is why I'm questioning if just 40 spouses or 40 people, maybe females, were diagnosed with this because I would imagine that number is a lot higher since everyone who has sex isn't having sex within the framework of a marriage. The next historical example is Henrietta Lacks, who's often referred to as the mother of medicine and her immortal cells are called HeLa cells and they still continue to impact um, medicine and research today. So Henrietta went to Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1951. Um, she had been diagnosed with a malignant tumor and she was to have surgery to have that removed. Um, her doctor diagnosed her with cervical cancer and some of her cells were given to another doctor at a lab. And that's when he discovered um, how unique Mrs. Lack's cells were. They doubled every 20 to 24 hours and other cells of other patients simply died. So Henrietta Lack's cells were the first um, human living cell line. And they helped scientists and doctors then and still continue to help people, um, even with vaccine development, um, her cells contributed to vaccine development for COVID-19. 
Now, here we go again with um, uninformed consent. So Henrietta Lacks's cancerous cells were taken, but they were taken without her consent while she was undergoing treatment for cancer. And she got her treatment at one of the few hospitals that had offered um, care to black people at that time. None of the biotechnology companies that um, made money from her cells gave the money to her family. And even after her death, doctors and scientists never asked her surviving family members for permission to use her name or reveal her name to the public, share her medical records with the media, or even um, publish her genome online. So um, there was no permission requested, consent, anything. This has a better ending than some of the earlier cases I talked about. There is some redemption here. Um, now people are more aware of ethics in medicine and science. Johns Hopkins has been working with members of Henrietta Lacks's family since 2010, and they've developed a series of programs to honor her memory. Um, and they've made contributions to um, area schools. They've established scholarships. There are two annual symposiums that focus on ethics and medicine today, and they even established a Henrietta Lacks Memorial Award. So, um, you know, they've they realized um, what inequity, um, what wrong was done, and they've made um, strides to try to make things right. And Henrietta's family, um, I've seen them in interviews and things. They are. They, are, they seem very happy to, to see all of the, um, the good things that Johns Hopkins Institute is doing. They're very proud of her um, cells contributions to um, modern day science. Sterilization practices, or I should say forced sterilization, unconsented sterilization, however you wanna refer to it. Um, Fannie Lou Townsend Hamer um, was not the only victim of um, sterilization, but I thought I'd use her since um, she's a well-known name because of her um, activism in the civil rights movement and voting in women's rights. So um, she came from humble beginnings. She was born in Mississippi, youngest of 20 kids, um, very poor family. She worked on a plantation with her family picking cotton. So she went to the doctors in 1961 for a uterine fibroid surgery. What she found out after surgery was they had performed a hysterectomy without her consent. Um, this practice in Mississippi became known as the Mississippi appendectomy, and it was widespread where um, doctors would perform um, hysterectomies, um, tubal ligation uh, procedures on Black women, and it was a way to reduce the Black population. Um, even before this um, happened to Henrietta, or sorry, Fannie Lou Townsend Hamer, um, eugenics practices date back to the 30s. Um, and at that time, it wasn't just black people who were the target of sterilization. Black people, indigenous people, um, anyone basically who wasn't white, people who had mental or intellectual disabilities. Um, so this was a bit of um, population control for those who were deemed um, less smart, feeble-minded. And um, it was common practice, so common that in the 1930s, at least 30 states had legislation that made this practice okay. And um, here's a quote from Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, she said, in North Sunflower County Hospital, I would say six out of the 10 Negro women who go to that hospital are sterilized with tubes tied. And of course, that would be um, without consent, once again, sadly. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand things back over to Celia. Oh, Celia, you're on mute. Okay, so th thank you for that. 
So this next slide, we're gonna talk about black women in higher risk. Uh, we talked a little bit about things that they are at higher risk for like heart disease, fibroids, cancer, maternal mortality, but there are other health conditions that impact black women. That includes cervical cancer, which is very preventable and should be non-existent in present day, strokes, diabetes. Some of the other issues that, uh, or physical and mental issues that uh, black women face include mental illness. That oftentimes has been said to be secondary to economical insecurity and racism, which can negatively impact their health status in the black community overall. Black women are often frequently the pillars of their community, often taking care of not only themselves, but their families, um, and oftentimes the healthcare workers, mostly home health aid providers. And so some of that they often, you know, don't fully take care of themselves because of the additional responsibilities. Black women are essentially very vulnerable to the wrestling with mental health. Oftentimes there's this trope that about strong black women. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight with Deborah talking about um, Dr. Sims, when those procedures were being performed, oftentimes it was other black women, other black slaves that had to hold down um, one of the slaves while getting that procedure. So when we're talking about black women and uh, there is this trope that says that black women are supposed to be strong. And oftentimes trying to be the pillar of the community, trying to hold the family unit together, whether that's you know working full time, taking care of the kids, taking care of an ill family, they have um, higher reports of sadness or hopelessness, sometimes even feeling very worthless. And that essentially is over, uh, you have more of that hopelessness sadness than white women. Depression may also show be shown in agitation uh, with many black women, uh, which is often misinterpreted as, you know, being aggressive. Uh, but it's just because of having the burden of having to carry all these responsibilities. Um, Deborah talked about uh, the Tuskegee study and syphilis. And one of the other medical conditions that uh, Black women are more at higher risk for is STDs, like chlamydia and HIV, uh, even syphilis. And it's not because Black women are having more sex than anybody else. The fact is that there's a lack of access to good preventative care. That is essentially the crux. And having to, um, and because you have lack of access to see, get preventative care, uh, to see healthcare providers on a regular basis, to be educated about safer practices, that becomes problematic um, and further perpetuates the cycle. Another um, big thing is intimate partner violence often leads to increased risk of health, uh, secondary to physical violence. I would say growing up in my home, there was a lot of um, physical abuse to my mom. Um, so growing up, seeing her with that, she is now in her 60s having a lot of residual um, pain um, and, you know, just a lot of uh, psychological complications based on what she went through earlier on in life. Another risk, sickle cell disease, that's often caused by um, essentially the blood, which usually should be circled is more sickled and can cause some anemia. So that is one of the biggest things that uh, the black population often suffers with, but um, oftentimes about uh, that, that's one of the things that are, make you higher risk. Another piece is premature delivery. Unfortunately, black women are more susceptible to going into labor too early. Um, there's been some studies done that talked about a lot of toxic stress while in pregnancy. Um, and like I said, intimate partner violence also has something to do with that. Um, and then of course, trying to, like I said, manage all these other different things also increases your stress. Okay. So we'll talk first about maternal mortality. We know that the United States has the highest maternal mortality rate, which is sad. I mean, compared to, this is not a third world country. Um, 700 women die each year in the United States as a result of these pregnancy and delivery complications. We know that in 2018, the national maternity mortality rate uh, was about 17%. 
or 17.4 deaths per 100,000 births. But when you talk about Black women, that equated to about 37.1 um, per 100,000 births. We know that Black women often have a lack of access to quality conceptive, contraceptive care and counseling. And, and that one of the interesting things I found was that Black serving hospitals have higher rates of maternal mortality than other hospitals. They also perform worse on 12 to 15 birth outcomes, including elective deliveries, non-elective C-sections, and overall maternal mortality. When we talk about, I talked a little bit about that the disparities really starts in birth. One of the uh, statistics here is that African-American infants are 3.8 times as likely to die from complications related to low birth weight as compared to non-Hispanic white infants. And essentially to improve Black women's maternal health, we know that there has to be this multifaceted approach that address Black women's health across the lifespan. You really need to improve access to high quality care. You need to address the social determinants of health. We talked about the housing, adequate food, um, you know, education, and, and that essentially will help provide greater economical security. Okay, so when we talk about um, cancer, cancer is the leading cause among, of, of death among Black women. Some of the statistics in, uh, for the literature, African-American women are twice as likely to be diagnosed with stomach cancer than um, they are 2.5, excuse me, 2.2 times as likely to die from stomach cancer compared to non-Hispanic white women. And the incidence of breast cancer is lower among African-American women but uh, yet this group has the higher rates of breast cancer deaths. So you may say, okay, well, why is that? Um, because oftentimes, you know, they're getting detected later and oftentimes, um, you know, it's just really detected at a, a later stage or if that case of, you know, they present and tell you something's wrong and they get dismissed and say, you know, that everything is fine. And oftentimes that black women tend to have more denser breast tissue. So, if they, you know, with that in mind, having to have more scans, whether they need to come in for mammograms and come in and get ultrasounds, there may be an issue with lack of access with that too, or not being able to take off the additional time um, from work or different things. So there's a variety of different reasons. And we know that African-American women have a 40% higher mortality rate of the breast cancer. So in terms of fibroids, 32% of Black women wait more than five years before seeking medical treatment compared to 17% of whites, uh, white women. 80% of American women um, before the age of 50 uh, are essentially get um, hysterectomies. And we heard about um, Fanny with, who woke up essentially and had a hysterectomy. Um, oftentimes, African-American women are not, they, they're not given alternatives. Oftentimes that is essentially the first thing that the provider or the physician really um, offers them. So there's, so they are not often offered those non-invasive choices. Um, black women tend to also wait, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that, but black women are up to three times more likely to be affected by uterine fibers. So, and some of the reasons oftentimes higher rates of obesity, higher rates of vitamin D deficiency, more frequent use of hair relaxers, inequities and in access to healthcare. So here we go again with the narrative about limited access to care. Um, oftentimes there's a genetic link to more fibroids. Uh, we know that early diagnosis and treatment are essential for improving health count outcomes in black women with uterine fibers. Um, but essentially it's apparently getting there, getting access and being detected sooner which is the issue. So when we talk about heart disease, we know the cardiovascular disease kills nearly 50,000 African-American women, African -American women annually. One out of five African-American women um, are believed to be at risk. We know that about 36% of African-American women um, know that heart disease is their greatest health risk, um, but oftentimes they're not, like I said, getting access to care um, to get the appropriate treatment that they need. Uh, other 
causes include, uh, contributing factors include diabetes, smoking, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you know, physical inactivity, um, obesity. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a large family history of heart disease that makes you more at risk, those are some of the challenges that Black women face. So when we talk about some of the common health risks, uh, some of the issues include, you know, there's a big, uh, it, the increased mortality. There is a lot of anxiety with being black and female within the healthcare system. Uh, we know that uh, oftentimes, you know, many women are afraid to go to their doctor because they feel like they're gonna be brushed off, dismissed, unheard, uh, or the care, you know, or often they've had bad experiences with them. They've had to, leave that provider, go to another one, and that kind of starts everything all over again. So they often the diagnosis is delayed and thus for the treatment is delayed. So we know that physicians and providers are under a lot of time pressure. We know that oftentimes they're only getting maybe 15 minutes with their um, patients. But what we do know about bias is that when someone is under pressure, they tend to um, default to their stereotypic unconscious bias, essentially. Um, it's, it's essentially kind of like a mental shortcut. We know that because you're limited. So when we talk about if you have adequate access to care, then you can ultimately try to prevent it. But when you don't have good access to care, oftentimes you are presenting to the hospital later in your stage, which means that you're going to need more aggressive treatment and therapy. So essentially, the, uh, your care becomes higher. Uh, the cost of your care becomes higher uh, when you're going to a lot of providers that constantly dismiss you, don't think that uh, they or undervalue you, uh, don't give you the appropriate follow-ups and referrals that you need. That essentially leads to a lot of sadness, depression, feeling, anxiety, um, and trauma. And of course, with that being said, if you're not getting the appropriate access to care, the appropriate treatment to care, then you're going to have poorer health outcomes. Okay, so now when we look at uh, health inequities, we're going to look at some women that I'm sure many of you may know that have been impacted by racial disparities in health care. Uh, the, the literature would or society would have you believe that, you know, it's just you end up having poor health care disparities because you're poor. But if you look at these women here, Serena Williams, um, great tennis player, rich, but that doesn't protect you from the health care disparities. She was, after she had an emergency C-section, she um, was having a lot of shortness of breath, thought she had a PE, and um, basically she kept telling her providers and they kept really dismissing her. And that delay in care, you know, it was a good outcome, but the fact of it is, is she could have lost her life based on that. When we talk about Kara Johnson, um, she was a woman that was married, already had a child, um, spoke five languages, very educated, her father was a judge. And uh, after she had her child, uh, her husband was essentially was sitting at her bedside, saw that her Foley bag was full of blood, told the healthcare providers, they kept saying, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna order cat, an emergency CAT scan. Um, the time just went by and I think they told her that around four o'clock and it wasn't until like midnight the next day, essentially, that she got this CAT scan. But by that time she had so much blood in her abdomen that essentially she lost her life. So that's just one of the other examples you know, even when you're trying to advocate or someone in your family is trying to advocate for you, you still are unheard um, and dismissed. Uh, Dr. Susan Moore recently admitted to the hospital. She a, was a family physician, came in very short of breath, um, basically um, diagnosed with COVID and, you know, having a lot of pain and her pro the provider really just dismissed her and tried to call her a drug addict because she was having so much pain she needed medicine and they didn't want to give her any medicine. So because there's another racial statistic that says um, African Americans have, um, you know, thicker skin and um, that they are immune to pain for some reason. 
So, and you know, it, even in our curriculum at a lot of medical schools, that narrative was still kind of um, continuing. So that often impedes the care that African-American women are receiving. So that's just one, just a little bit of overview of some women that are not poor, they're rich, they're you're educated, but you're still trying to advocate for yourself, for yourself in a um, essentially a racist system. And you ultimately, you know, could have lost your life or lost your life based on that. So when we think about why, uh, what are some of the barriers to treatment, I will tell you that uh, some of them include, you know, overall, you know, when you do go to your provider, they don't give you the adequate care that you need, or they dismiss you. Uh, they are approaching you with their, their own bias. You know, what's your income? Do you even have money to pay your co-pays? We know that due to racism, sexism, and other systemic barriers that are that have contributed to income inequality, Black women are typically paid like 63, 63 cents for every dollar compared to a, a white non-Hispanic man. So when you're not getting adequate money, then, you're, then your access, your priorities are gonna become different. So for example, I work with stroke patients. Oftentimes stroke patients tend to have a lot of risk factors like high, high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol problems. But if you are someone that's coming in, and like even with COVID, when a lot of essential workers who are, who are typically African-American women, um, when they're coming in with um, being, well, whether they're being laid off during this time, if you have to choose between paying your rent or picking up your medications, oftentimes your medication is going to suffer over paying your rent. So essentially there's a huge wage gap that needs to be eliminated. And some, one of the articles that I found basically said on average, a black woman working full time year round would have enough money for approximately many of these things. If the wage gap was eliminated, she could have two and a half years of childcare, um, more than two and a half additional years of tuition fees for her four year um, degree or to pay for her full cost of her tuition at a two-year college. She would have more than 16 additional months of premiums for employer-based health insurance. And oftentimes, African-American women tend to be underinsured or have no insurance. Other things that if the wage gap was eliminated, she would be able to have 156 more weeks of food for her family, which is essentially three years, 15 additional months of mortgage and utility payments, and 22 months of rent. So like I said, so that income gap affects a lot of these other social determinants, housing, food, education. So just to give you an overview, and oftentimes another issue other than lack of access to care is legislation. What role does legislation play in you know, perpetuating the cycle of poor health for African-American women? Uh, when we talk about Flint, Michigan, that was essentially one um, issue with legislation that led to unethical water usage and worsening health impacts for black and brown individuals. Another thing is language, um, stereotype language, uh, like even I was reading a couple articles and, you know, when they just write blacks, you know, that can be very offensive. Uh, so language in itself um, and the way someone is talked to also impacts them wanting to go for care. One of my friends put up something on Facebook the other day after a primary health appointment. She had some shoulder pain. She went to see her doctor. She had a shirt on that says Black Lives Matter. The doctor during the visit told her to do a, um, a, a hail Hitler. And, you know, she was very offended by that because, you know, it's like, of all the terminology, of all the things you could have said, why would you use that terminology? So that's one of the things that impact care as well. When we talk about um, insurance, more than 3.3 million Black women or one in four nationally are covered by Medicaid. Well, that affects the access of care because oftentimes there's many organizations that don't take Medicaid. So even if you have some form of uh, um, insurance, if, they, if organizations don't take it, then you still don't have access. Um, black women and the, the uninsured rate for black women 
is highest in the South. And if you know anything about the South, they've often called that the stroke belt. Um, so, and that's mostly because legislation and those are the states that didn't have expanded Medicaid coverage. So the most vulnerable populations that need that are, don't have the ability to get it. And nearly 14% of black women are uninsured compared to 8% of white women. And like I mentioned, dismissive care, lack of providers of color, I think um, is about 5% of providers of color. And of course, if you're not able to relate to the population that you serve, that can definitely be problematic and lead to poor outcomes. Other things we talked about, income, education, and um, employment. And one of the biggest things I would say is that even though African-American women have been said to be the most educated, that does not equate to employability. And I will, we're gonna discuss policy and legislation. So I will turn that over to Deborah. All right, thank you. Um, so, so Celia talked about this a little earlier, but we know that um, true change in healthcare. Sorry, you want to you want to switch your presentation view? Oh, sorry. Thanks for letting me know that. I clicked on the wrong one. Let's go here. little technology problem. <laughs> All right, bear with me while I advance. How's that? Okay, it's so um, you have to what's share it? it? It's that we can't see it. Yeah, we have to share it. That would help. <laughs> Sorry, getting ahead of myself here. Share screen. Let's go back here from the beginning. All right, let's get back to policy and legislation. Okay, do you see a screen that says policy and legislation? Looks great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, we know that true change comes through policy and legislation. And what we especially count on policy and legislation for is improved access, um, improved quality of healthcare, as well as affordability. And some legislation can be beneficial. At other times, it can be um, a detriment to care. So I'm going to start out with some positive, sunnier pieces of legislation um, that New York State um, residents benefit from. So there was the Get Screened, No Excuses legislation in 2017 um, to support mammography access. So this essentially increased accessibility of mammograms by extending the hours in which um, hospitals and clinics offered screening. We know that everybody can't get to the doctors within the nine to five framework. Um, it also gave people permission to leave work, have time away from work in order to get the procedure done. Um, public employers have to give public employees four hours of leave each year for that screening. It also made this um, affordable. Um, we know that the cost can often um, discourage people from getting services done. Um, just as Celia mentioned earlier, sometimes if you have to choose between um, refilling a prescription or paying the rent or the mortgage, you're gonna pay the rent or the mortgage and you might sacrifice um, medical treatment or prescription refills. So this law also eliminated annual deductibles, co-payments um, and co-insurance for mammograms. So this just made life a lot easier for anyone who needed to get a mammogram 
but may have otherwise um, not pursued the procedure due to obstacles. Another um, piece of legislation was Shannon's Law, which was passed in 2019, and it was named after Shannon Saturno. Um, unfortunately, she passed away of breast cancer at the young age of 31. Um, she was diagnosed at 28. Um, but at the time of her um, diagnosis and her death, um, insurance companies were only required to cover mammograms for women ages 40 and over. So she fell below that um, age line. Now the law requires large group insurers to cover um, medically necessary mammograms for women ages 35 to 39. And data shows us that over 12,000 cases for breast cancer detected annually are in women under the age of 40. So um, this legislation can help get some diagnoses made early and hopefully save some lives. Uh, Celia also talked about maternal mortality and morbidity earlier. Um, well, we have um, in New York State um, some maternal health legislation. A task force was developed in 2018 to develop um, recommendations to reduce maternal mortality and to also look at racial disparities and outcome for women of color. And in 2019, Maternal Mortality Review Board was established and they reviewed um, the cause of maternal deaths in New York State and made recommendations to the Department of Health on strategies to prevent future deaths. And one quote from um, Governor Cuomo, he made this quote after he signed this in law was, racial disparities and maternal mortality um, is a national crisis. And with the creation of this expert review board and advisory council, we're tackling the problem head on to ensure safer, healthier pregnancies for all. So again, this was another a beneficial piece of legislation for New Yorkers. Um, there are some current bills that are up for passing and review. Um, one bill is called the Extend Medicaid Coverage from 60 Days to One Year Post-Pregnancy or Delivery. And this bill would offer coverage for um, anyone after birth one year, because right now it's simply 60 days. And we know that a lot can happen after 60 days. So um, people who don't qualify for Medicaid essentially lose their coverage 60 days after the end of pregnancy. Um, one in three pregnancy deaths occur one week to one year following birth or delivery. And one in three people experience a disruption or interruption in insurance coverage before, during, or after pregnancy. Um, so this is a good, um, this would be a good bill to um, support mater healthy maternity. Another bill um, that will um, also support maternity is the improved access to midwifery led birthing centers. So midwives provide um, quality patient-centered maternity care, and every person has the right to give birth with dignity and a safe and supported environment of their choosing. Um, so that would respect that right. Many people want to give birth with the assistance and support of a midwife. Um, and it also um, says that New York should identify opportunities to expand access to midwives um, including passing legislation that supports the establishment of freestanding birthing centers led by licensed midwives and advancing initiatives that will increase diversity of midwives across the state. And, you know, people of all races and ethnicities um, use midwives, but I think this is something that is especially um, appreciated in communities of color. They have a long history of um, giving birth with the assistance of a midwife. Now, this is an example of legislation gone wrong, um, a piece of legislation that was that detrimental to access to health care, the um, domestic gag rule. So if you're familiar with um, Title X, Title X is a federal program. It was created in 1970. It was bipartisan, but basically ensured that everyone, um, regardless of 
their income and whether or not they had insurance could have access to basic services. And those basic services include um, birth control, cancer screenings for cervical and breast cancer, um, FPI testing, testing for sexually transmitted infections, and other essential reproductive health care. The Trump and Pence administration um, established this gag rule, and basically it slashed the um, patient capacity for Title X. So what it ended up requiring of healthcare providers was if they wanted to continue to receive funding from the government through Title X, they would not be allowed to um, suggest, share, refer, provide any information to their patients regarding abortion. So even if a patient asked about abortion, um, if you gave them information, you would be relinquishing your access to the Title X fund. And of course, that is unethical. Um, doctors would be required, doctors, medical professionals, nurses, if a patient is interested in options, be it abortion, adoption, um, going through with delivery, you are required to answer their questions give them the information they want, make referrals, um, provide brochures, pamphlets. But this was an attack on reproductive health rights. So organizations like Planned Parenthood um, relinquished the um, access to Title X, and instead um, we are getting support for those services that were once covered by Title X through the New York State Department of Health and the um, Family Planning Benefits Program because we did not want to be unethical and deny our patients um, access to information that they um, wanted. And this is the case for several health clinics um, and hospitals across the country. Many people um, had to go out of business because they were unable to um, continue to provide services without those much needed funds. So this legislation created barriers to affordable and high quality health care for people who are already struggling financially. Title X serves 4 million people and two thirds of those people are living under the um, federal poverty line or poverty level. And half of them have no insurance. And many of the people who rely on Title X were black and Latino and identified as LGBTQ. And these are also the audiences that are um, likely to face worse health and economic impacts from um, COVID-19. In addition, um, you should also just be reminded, and Celia mentioned some of this earlier, that um, Black women are four times likely to contract HIV, um, and the death rate for breast cancer is higher in Black women um, than other groups. The good news is that the Supreme Court is going to hear three cases um, that challenge the gag rule. So um, there is hope in the horizon down the road. And I've, um, including abortion, um, because I thought it was important to include um, access to um, reproductive health rights since we started the presentation earlier talking about for sterilization and eugenics. So um, the US has a long history of policing black bodies. Um, abortion is legal in the US, um, contrary to what some might think or hope for, but abortion is legal thanks to the landmark case of Roe v. Wade. But depending on where you live in the US, it may or may not be accessible or easily accessible for you. And I put, I'll show you some more statistics with the maps and things like that. But um, the Guttmacher Institute is a great resource um, for information and data on reproductive and sexual health. But according to Guttmacher Institute, black women had the highest abortion rate in 2014. So 27 per 1000 women of reproductive health age. And between 2008 and 2014, women of color experienced the steepest decline in abortion rates. So we might say, and I won't say we, but according to Guttmacher, they said the reason for this 
is probably due to a combination of factors, um, discrimination, racism, as well as lack to affordable um, quality health care and lack of health insurance. So again, we keep repeating um, the same barrier issues. So this is a map of the US and this is from 2019. But we see that um, the states in orange have enacted abortion restrictions. The ones in blue have done more to protect or expand access to abortion. But what's interesting is that many of the states um, with the most abortion bans are also states that have the highest population um, average of Black people. And some of those same states also have um, voter su suppression legislation, stand your ground laws, and anti-immigration legislation. So I thought that was interesting um, correlation there. In 2019, although this um, map says 17 states enacted some type of restriction, in 2019, there were actually 25 abortion bans um, made in 12 states, including some of these states with the highest population of Blacks, states like Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. And this graphic just gives you some information on who's having abortions, um, income levels, 75% poor, or low income, 39% um, white, 28% black, 59% um, already have a child, 60% um, are in their 20s, only 12% are teens, of which 4% are minors. Um, and black people are more likely to depend on Medicaid for healthcare and um, thanks to the Hyde Amendment, they are more likely to be barred from um, using their own insurance to access safe and legal abortion because the Hyde Amendment um, prohibits use of federal funds to support abortion costs. So if you're on Medicaid, um, you're not going to be able to use Medicaid to cover um, fees associated with abortion. And three and a half million Black people already face systemic barriers to health care. And those three and a half million people um, stand to have their state ban access to abortion care if um, the Supreme Court ever took away the protections of Roe v. Wade. Um, I think even already, we're only in February, something like 200 um, restrictions have been proposed by various states in um, abortion access. So um, this is an attack, continued attack on um, reproductive health rights. This is another um, example of legislation being a detriment. Um, and this is limiting access to contraceptives, um, birth control care. So Little Sisters of the Poor versus Pennsylvania. Um, basically it challenged or undid the Affordable Care Act um, requirements that health plans cover preventive services like contraception without co-pays um, or out-of-pocket costs. And 62 million people have um, benefited from this service. So if you take access to birth control away and require patients to pay for that out-of-pocket, it could be a burden for many people and many people might go without um, birth control and therefore end up with an unintended pregnancy. So the Supreme Court decided Little Sisters of the Poor and upheld the Trump Pence um, rule that allows any employer or university to exempt itself from the Affordable Care Act's requirement of contraception coverage. So that basically means your employer can say, I have a religious or moral objection, so we will not contribute to covering your birth control costs therefore denying the employee um, access to free birth control. So this is impacting hundreds of thousands of people nationwide. Um, so now essentially their access to birth control is going to be left up to their, their boss or manager. Um, and now some people are gonna just have to pay for birth control out of pocket um, if they once relied on it being covered by their employers. Um, and this decision, again, will disproportionately affect low-wage workers, people of color, um, 
LGBTQ people, many of these people already face tremendous challenges in accessing um, quality and affordable health care. So what does this mean for New York State? Luckily, um, in 2019, the Comprehens Comprehensive Contraceptive Coverage Act was signed by Governor Cuomo, which created um, coverage for birth control, allowing New Yorkers to have access to birth control without out-of-pocket expenses. Now, this covers New Yorkers whose plan is not governed by the federal law. Unfortunately, if your insurance plan is governed by the federal law, you are not protected by the Comprehensive, Comprece Comprehensive Contraceptive Coverage Act. So I say that 10 times. So um, it's estimated that more than 50% of individuals with employer-sponsored health coverage have this type of federal plan. And um, this decision will make it possible for um, some New York residents um, with employers, with insurance governed by the federal law to claim religious or moral exemptions. Um, again, allowing people access to birth control and really it shouldn't be up to your, your boss or your supervisor to decide um, those types of decisions. So um, this is an example of, you know, one part was bad, the little sisters of the poor versus Pennsylvania. Um, but fortunately, if you're a New York state resident and you have a state covered plan, um, you are protected. But um, unfortunately, several people will be left out in the cold um, because of that. So we're coming close to the end of our um, presentation. Let's think about strategies to mitigate maltreatment. Um, and the basics are education, advocacy, and policy reform. And I wanna share a quote made by Michelle Obama following the death of George Floyd. She said, race and racism is a reality that so many of us grow up learning to just deal with. But if we ever hope to move past it, it can't just be on the people of color to deal with it. It's up to all of us, black, white, everyone, no matter how well-meaning we think we might be to do the honest, uncomfortable work of rooting it out. It starts with self-examination and listening to those whose lives are different from our own. It ends with justice, compassion, and empathy that manifest in our lives and on our streets. So education, um, like what you're doing right now, you're participating in the, um, this presentation as a passive attendee. Um, go to lectures, learn more, read, listen, understand that disparities in healthcare didn't happen overnight. Um, but they've been reinforced over many centuries um, through white supremacy, white supremacy seeping into many institutions of um, the US. It's a big pill for a lot of people to swallow, but um, I think you have to realize that. And there's so much information out there now um, for people to access, even if you're not a believer. Um, you have to acknowledge that racism and white privilege exist have those uncomfortable conversations and again, learn. Um, there are a lot of people who just simply had no idea about this stuff, but if you, we all come to a place where we're open to learning and being educated and educating others, um, it will do us all good in the end. Advocacy, um, we can advocate for better accessibility to healthcare um, for us, everybody in our community, those who look like us and those who don't look like us. Um, we can advocate for people who don't have access to information. Again, just going back to what's happening now with COVID-19, um, you see communities coming together, churches, um, health coalitions. Think of groups like the Black Physicians Network, um, Common Ground Health, African American um, Coalition, the Latino Health Coalition. Um, people are partnering with small businesses, with local government um, to make sure that the people who need the information most but might not have access to it um, aren't left out in the cold or in the dark. So um, as a community, we have to come together and take care of those who may not be in the know, may not have access to a computer or the internet um, and might not have transportation. 
to get services, whether it's a COVID vaccine or testing or access for transportation to get screen for high blood pressure. So we're really seeing um, communities coming together and um, helping one another. I mean, I'll use myself as an example. I am getting my COVID shot in March because I have asthma. However, it took me forever to get online. I had my laptop going, my cell phone going. I was in a virtual line like three times and kicked out. Finally, I logged back in at three in the morning and that's how I got my appointment because no one else was on the computer at three in the morning. But Everybody can't log in at three in the morning and everyone doesn't have the luxury of just sitting in front of a computer on a Sunday trying to get in. Luckily, I don't work on Sundays, but um, I have a cell phone, I have the laptop, I have, I have several devices here, but still I was having no luck even with multiple devices um, on at the time. So I did get my appointment, but I had to wait until three in the morning when the server wasn't so overwhelmed. Finally policy reform. Um, we have to demand change from our elected officials and from our institutions. We have to share our concerns. We've elected these people to office, be it assembly member, um, senator, congressperson. So we have to demand change um, as their constituents um, who voted them in and tell them about these issues that concern us and ask that they support reform, policy reform to make things better. Uh, please, uh, please just, just leave it up. Okay, uh, and I have, one, I'm sorry, I, what was that? I think there's one more slide before this one, but just continue with your slides, let's not switch back and forth. Okay, nope, that was it, um, Q&A. Okay. I thought there was another one here. There was, I'll go ahead and read it. You um, read the, the wonderful quote. <laughs> yeah. So this quote basically said it's racism, not race, that affects Black women's health. We know that Black women have difficulty access to accessing health care. Um, when we talk about the wage gap, they have difficulty with earnings or access to much needed social supports like child care, elder care. Essentially, Black women are getting the short end of the stick despite having contributed so much to building this nation. So like I said before, Black women often, you know, being Black and female is a double whammy. Um, so when we think about other ways to advocate, I would also say think about advocating uh, for wage equality, you know, equal pay, equal work. Um, so I'll stop there and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate this presentation and I am positive that there's going to be questions. I can help field them if people want to unmike or post their questions in chat. There's a question in chat from Michael. He says, although anti-racism is beginning to be taught throughout all disciplines, I'm wondering how it is taught and executed in the medical field. And then following, do you believe that there will be forthcoming changes to the role that anti-racism plays in medical education programs? I would honestly say, um, will there be changes? Yes. Is it going to be a fast change? Likely not. Um, this conversation is even being had at the University of Rochester. Uh, and I just spoke to uh, the director of neurology, the chairperson of neurology at U of R yesterday, because he wanted to know how can we make our department better? What can we do to change our curriculum? So a lot of this is being talked about uh, because we're, we're definitely calling organizations out, um, saying that you know your curriculum perpetuates a certain um, stereotype, your, your um, curriculum um, talks about, uh, like I said, impacts the way um, patients get medical treatment. Uh, when we talk about pain, uh, they often don't get the same treatment in terms of needing pain. They're seen as drug addicts in terms of the Black community. So this, this, these conversations is, are being had. I know the, um, the AMA, which is like the Medical Association, 
have put out some position statements on you know racism itself and they are trying to do better with the, the programming and the curriculum so at a local level i would say these conversations are being had there are um, things trying to be the organizations are trying to do better um, but of course it's a work in progress because they're also trying to um, educate themselves at the same time so we are also calling out schools of nursing how do they perpetuate the cycle another piece that we're um, calling out how many people are uh, people of color are actually getting into these programs uh, when i think recently there was probably like one person of color at u of r with over 200 medical students i mean so this is another thing you're going to keep having um you know a lack of providers of color if they're not being let into your program for one reason or another so essentially like i said we uh, being a nurse, we're working on the nursing programs to help them identify what role they play. And I, we have had some conversations locally um, with some, um, some leadership at the medical center to figure out how they can do better. So, yes. And I will add that with that maternal, maternal mortality morbidity review board that I mentioned, there are monies in that, um, in that task force or that board that are dedicated to education on implicit bias. Um, so training like that is necessary. It will you know, only go so far in one particular branch of medicine or science, but hopefully we'll see that happening across the board, across disciplines, um, because it's really, a, it's, it's a true crisis in the healthcare arena and we need more of this type of implicit bias training to ensure that our um, black patients, black and brown patients, poor patients um, receive the care that they need and don't have to advocate so hard to be heard. Yeah, so definitely really educating about, you know, the social problems too. You know, patients need to, you know, physicians, they're coming out, they're focused on the cure. Um, but we also have to look at the whole patient because like I said, housing, you know, if you're living in a house, that's kind of like, you, you have a poor uh, slumlord, you know, that's not taking care of the place, not making um, the appropriate um, changes to the, the house. Um, if it's like infested with mold, that's going to affect, you know, um, Deborah talked about her having asthma, that's going to impact someone's breathing, their asthma. Um, and uh, essentially, we're going to see those individuals in the hospital. So those social problems that, you know, nobody wants to pay attention to will ultimately you will see these patients in the hospital. So we need to pay more attention to that and look at the whole patient. That was a great question, Michael. Thank you. Um, who else has a question? Zoe says, how has your knowledge changed the way you see the world? Do you feel optimistic on our generation, which is Gen Z and generations below us on our ability to change how things are done in all sorts of different settings and scenarios? Well, I feel optimistic because I think of even, um, I mean, many of our, our activist movements are being led by youth. Um, you think of the students in Parkland, Florida after um, the tragedy, the shooting, at their school. So young people are becoming a lot more active. I know those young people aren't particularly, what was that, Generation Z? <laughs> I get lost with the uh, the generations and ages, but I am optimistic um, of our um, young leaders because when you think of Black Lives Matter, you know, that was embraced by all ages, but there were an awful lot of young people out there um, taking to the streets. And I think they're just as concerned as, you know, someone who's old enough to be their grandparent because this is their future um, and they have to um, make it right, um, get reform in place and everything like that. So I feel optimistic. I mean, as terrible of a year that 2020 was because of COVID-19 and because of the unfortunate deaths of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, and the list goes on and on, Daniel Prude, I feel like it was a wake up call that we needed so much happened at the same time. Um, 
sadly tragedies um, in the midst of a pandemic. But I think, you know, even though we were in the midst of a pandemic, to see the way people took to the streets to express, you know, their disgust, their, you know, their sadness, whatever rage you want to call it, um, it speaks volumes. I would say I agree with that. Um, I've definitely seen a lot more youth participating and I think um, they are, you know, they are the future essentially. So, you know, I would definitely say I'm optimistic. Um, overall, I guess, um, just trying to go back to the question real quick. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, even just in my, um, I haven't been doing advocacy work for a ton of years over the last six years. But as I've been doing that, even with, you know, the thing that I, you know, the education that I do with human trafficking, it wasn't until then that I started realizing that, you know, it doesn't happen in a vacuum, that, you know, there are so many other systems that are impacted. And for me to be a better advocate, even for just victims of trafficking, I need to now be a better advocate for all these other systems and be at some of these other tables and really learn more about them. So I would say I'm definitely optimistic. I would say there's, we, we do still have a long way to go. I always say, uh, you know, really be curious. Um, and, I, you know, some really saying, you know, focusing on just anti-racist, I think some people re kind of resent that, but because, you know, you feel like you're being forced to, you know, believe one way or the other. I would say, just, just look at it from a human element, a human, look at it through a human lens. You know, at the end of the day, we know everybody should be treated equally and we're striving for equity. Um, but, you know, that's where that's the should be the goal, you know, but I would say just overall in the work that I've done, I've seen changes. This is the moment we need to keep the momentum going, got to keep educating ourselves. Um, and like I said, even for me doing this, I'm learning a lot more about history. Um, and the role that different systems play in it and just re really wanting to be a part of that change to make it better. So I hope that answered your question, but thank you for that. Great question, Zoe, I appreciate it. Crystal, do we have time for one more? How are we doing? Yes, I think one more question. That would be great, we've got five minutes. Uh, Rachel's in the chat and says, what influenced your decision to work in the field that you're in? Were there any challenges you faced while pursuing your professional careers and how did you overcome them? You wanna go first or you? Want to... Sure, um, I, okay, so what inspired me to do the work that I do? Honestly, I would say that um, I was a CNA, I was a CNA uh, and at a Hill Haven. Okay. Um, and I saw a few nurses that I was like, hmm, I could do a better job than them. Okay. So that was one, one thing. Um, but I felt this need, like I've always wanted to be an attorney. And I, I always had this sense of wanting to advocate for people. I didn't necessarily know how that was going to happen or how it was going to manifest in my life but I know I wanted to help people and I wanted to help their families and I just wanted to be a better advocate. So by, after that, finding out that I did not have to have like a political science degree to go to law school, I decided that I wanted to go back and be a nurse. In terms of challenges, some of the challenges I did face was, I think the biggest challenge I faced was going to Brockport. I mean, my, I, I had a horrible GPA. I didn't feel um, supported there. I had a teacher, at, we were taking um, some woman's health class. And, you know, and right in the middle of the class, I remember her saying something about, you know, black people were dirty or something like mm. that. And that was like the conversation. There was like, I'm sitting there, everyone's sitting there. It's very silent in the room. Um, Cause I'm thinking, is there a point to this? Like what, what, what's your point? And that just left me with this awful feeling. Nobody talked up, nobody said anything. Um, and she actually ended up giving me, I think, an E in the class, you know, so it was, oh yeah, it was, it was just horrible. It was just a horrible experience with her. So my GP, and I had to go to her and confront her and say, I, I, I'm confused here. I'm coming in, I'm doing the work. What, what is the issue? Um, you know, and of course, you know, she's not going to say that I'm racist. 
Um, but like I said, a lot of her behavior towards me, you know, I figured that had to be what it was. But that really, um, so just that experience in itself was a, a challenge. Um, but like I said, going in, going back for my NP at Fisher, I felt very supported that, that, that you know, it was completely different. Um, and what made me choose neurology in a sense was that um, I interviewed many different places and they kept giving me the runaround. They kept saying, we need more people with, we need, um, we need someone with more experience. Me, and I'm like, well, you knew that when you interviewed me that I was new out of school. So, you know, wasn't really understanding that. And then I actually got the job at neurology and ended up loving it. So that's why I stayed in it because it keeps me curious. It keeps me learning. Um, you know, it keeps me advocating uh, in terms of, you know, I know in I'm probably taking too long, but in terms of um, other things, in terms of the advocacy work that I do outside of here, it was really the awakening, especially for human trafficking, finding out about it for the first time finding out that 90% of victims come in contact with healthcare providers and we didn't know what to look for. And we could have played a role in helping connecting them to services. And really once I heard that, I couldn't unhear it. I couldn't unsee it. So after hearing that, then I was like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do with the next phase of my life. So I'll stop there, but I hope that answers your question. And my response is going to be shorter. I've only I've been at Planned Parenthood for almost three years, but I think of myself as uh, this queen of reinvention, um, lifelong learner, advocate for social justice. So um, as you know, I'd worked in a museum for 17 years prior to coming over to um, the healthcare advocacy world. And I've always believed in um, being able to use my skills in different ways. And, you know, I applied them in the museum for arts and education, um, accessibility, bringing the, the arts within reach of um, especially minority communities, black and brown communities who at one point hadn't had access to arts because of segregation laws. You couldn't go to art museums if you were of a certain generation or age because of um, segregation. But and when this opportunity came along to um, work at Planned Parenthood, it was perfect for my interest in advocacy work and accessibility um, issues because I think healthcare is very important um, regardless of what branch of healthcare um, you're looking for. So that's a right that everyone should have. I believe in the organization's mission and I thought I'd be able to make a contribution to um, that organization's mission. And I think having reproductive um, health choices is very important. And it's important that our community be educated, especially um, young people, not just young people, there are adults who don't know as much as they ought to know about sexual and reproductive health. Um, so I, <laughs> I think education for all pretty much, um, this is a very um, important component. We did get one more question in the chat. Can we keep you for two more minutes? Do we have time? Sure, okay. go for it. The question was, can you speak to challenging the status quo in one place of work? Reagan says, I'm, subcon I'm a subcontracted government employee and we're constantly reminded to remain neutral or advocate on our own time when we could, or we could lose funding. However, the folks we work with are directly impacted by the inequities in healthcare. This is so frustrating. We have to continue to ask our program to take a more vocal stance on racism in our community and to provide us with training. Mm. You wanna take that to Bora and then mm. I can go after you. Well, I'm gonna say that's a tricky one because mm -hmm. from my place of employment, you know, we've jumped in and rolled up our sleeves. And I see my colleague, Sarah Connors, on this um, call on the Zoom as well. So, you know, we stand up and address the issues of racism. You know, Planned Parenthood acknowledges um, the existence of white supremacy, our role in some of these inequities in sexual and reproductive health care, the role of um, medicine and scientists in some of these atrocities. But we also realize that, um, you know, it, you have to, it goes back to acknowledging 
So organizations like Planned Parenthood and many other organizations acknowledge the existence of inequities, of um, racism, of structural racism, and move forward and provide their staff with the resources they needed. I mean, Planned Parenthood has done a lot for our staff in relation to COVID-19 providing resources for support, because we know this has um, really done a number on our emotional and mental health. Um, as far as Black Lives Matter, we had Black Lives Matter signs at all of our health center locations. We had resources for employees, Black employees, white employees, um, giving white employees resources to better understand racism. Black employees who know about racism, giving them the resources that they need during this time of extreme Black fatigue. So I don't really know how to address your issue because I feel as if, you know, from my employer, and many other places of employment, so many people have been stepping up to the mic to acknowledge it and try to do better. Um, although I know with some people it's just lip service because everybody was putting a statement out on their website or sending <laughs> something out to their members to say how they, they are against uh, racism and they stand with Black Lives Matter. So, you know, you, you have to take it with, you look at each case individually um, and check for authenticity. Um, but I, I mean, I don't want you to lose your job or anything, but I'm not really certain how um, you can force that change in your place of employment if the employer isn't already willing to acknowledge that. And it's not about being, it, it's not like a Republican Democrat thing. We don't have to make this political, it's a human thing. So it's not about you, you know, being anti one politician or pro another, um, this goes beyond political lines. Well, so I guess what I would add um, in my organization, um, how I'm trying in the hospital, how I'm trying to address that. Um, I think it was about two years ago. Uh, I can literally, I think we have about 900 APPs, physician assistants and nurse practitioners. And I, uh, at a meeting that we had with the CEO or the president of the CEO of the hospital, I said, um, can you tell me uh, what we're doing for nurse practitioners of color? Uh, because I could literally count on one hand how many we have in this organization. His response to me was that another you know, um, woman of color that's in leadership here was trying to make some of those changes. And I said, well, she's making those changes at the LPN level, um, but I'm talking about the advanced practice level. So, you know, basically kind of was telling me that it was, you know, everybody's responsibility to push diversity and inclusion. I said, okay, fine. So that conversation really didn't go anywhere. Fast forwarding to 2020, suddenly we can get a diversity and inclusion person because it's popular now, okay? Um, it's not, you didn't do it because it was right. You did it because it was popular. Other organizations are doing it. So they have now instituted a diversity and inclusion person. Um, and I am also a part of the NP um, subcommittee here. And for me, I challenge the status quo by saying something. You know, you know I'll say, okay, here's an article about you know, the lack of diversity in NPs, I'll challenge them and say, you know, you've, you've designed this org chart. And as I look at this org chart, there's nobody of color on here. When I, I will call them out and say, you know, I walk down to the surgical unit and all I see are predominantly white women. And the response that I got was, I understand, I know, but the, the surgeons, and I'm like, we need to change that. So for me, I keep, I keep, you know, talking. I keep, you know, saying things. I had an um, exploratory interview recently with U of R. And my first question to um, the NP that's over there, organization there, I said, can you tell me a little bit of, about your diversity in your organization? And what percentage? Um, because you tell me 10% of the population here, um, you know, 10%, there is some room for you know, kind of like advancement in your career. Then my, like I said, my next question was talking about diversity. Well, then how diverse is your population? 
And she literally looked at me and was like, I'm going to be embarrassed. Um, I think it's about 10%, which basically means it's probably about 2.5 or 5%, okay, if not less than that. Um, but apparently when I, just yesterday, when I talked to one of the other doctors, he says, I saw her in the hallway and she said that after she talked to me, she thought about it all weekend. Good. So now you need to go change it. You know, so like I said, I'm not in that organization, but I told her a lot of your APPs in that organization are, we're, we're having book clubs and we're talking about the racial stuff, the microaggressions, the feeling dismissed you know, not getting promoted. We're talking about those issues and you need to do something about it in your organization. So that's how I do it. I challenge it, um, but that's just me. I would not want you to lose your job. <laughs> um, but one of the other things that I would say is there's a few resources. Maybe you can kind of do it an indirect approach of maybe let's start a book club. Let's start looking at some of these resources. And that way you can kind of get whoever wants to join joins, especially if there's some people with some like mind like you, they can join, you guys can break it down. Okay, we'll do chapter one and two because this is very heavy content. When you're talking about race, um, it can be very heavy, you know, but you want an opportunity to be able to discuss some of these things that you're reading and talk about it. You know, you may not, of course, you're not having the direct um, you may not be able to relate to the experience, but then you, like I said, educating yourself is the first step with that. So a couple of the resources that I would recommend, um, the memo, it's by Minda Hart, and it talks about how women of color can secure their seats at the table. I, I don't think it's just, I mean, a lot of men could be having this, you know, issue as well in terms of speaking up, but she gives some good practical tips in there that may be helpful. The other one would be political determinants of health. Um, and that makes the connection of those social issues, housing, employment, all those things with the legislation. And it even has some advocacy action plan in there. And that's by Daniel Doss. It's called the political determinants of health. So, so those are two resources that you can say, you know, if anybody wants to join a book club or if you want to read those in, in advance or just to generate some questions, um, I would say maybe that would be helpful. Well, again, we would like to thank our presenters for their time and most importantly, for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. Uh, we wanna thank our attendees for also joining us. And we hope that you enjoyed listening and hopefully you were able to take away something that you can apply as we, we move forward in this journey of anti-racism. Um, although this is the end of our planned events for Black History Month, please know that we are going to continue our discussions with events in the near future. And also don't forget to check out the Diversity Summit next Tuesday as well. So thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. Thank, thank you. you.